Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much for coming here to this talk. So, so this talk is kind of like co covers a lot of ground, but it's basically just revolving around one research question, namely whether um, parental education increases, uh, I don't know, whether children's education increases parental longevity. It is kind of like a question that's kind of like turns something that we've been interesting a bit around. And so the answer is kind of like you can see here in this table that summarizes the entire talk. Um, 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 kind of mixed. And it also shows us what we did. And if you're wondering who these we's are, then it is a lot of people, not just me, it's also Cecilia Potente, who is now an assistant professor in Rotterdam, Juan Madia, who is in Oxford in primary health care, uh, care health sciences, Christian Monnen in the sociology department, and Felix Tropf, who is at UCL and Purdue. And so generally, if you like anything in this talk, it's probably because of my co-authors. If there's anything you don't like, it's probably because I have done it. Um, and also, like a lot of this talk here is still like work in progress, as you can see. Um, so, so I'm interested in hearing your feedback. And also, like this is not one of those talks where I'm kind of like presenting a view of the world or anything this is not one of those talks where you come out and say wow i've really learned something it's probably some one of those talks where you come out and you have more questions that you had than in the beginning maybe it's a good thing um and so to start this is kind of like this is about like the education and the health of others and it's about spillover effects of education we kind of know that these exist so we know that when parents, uh, better educated parents have um, healthier children. And we also have evidence that this is probably causal. We also know that if you have a spouse who's better educated, or if you have siblings who's better educated, then um, this is also good for one's health. But what about your children's education is the question that we're asking here. Is there also a... Um, 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 spill over in the opposite direction that having better educated children is good for you. And so why would we um, care about this? Isn't this just kind of like ticking a box and kind of like this possible boxes of, no, but we also think that there's a good reasons to think that. And also like, particularly if you're thinking about like um, the current issues in society, if you think about the climate crisis or the housing crisis, or if you can remember the COVID crisis, um, then there's also a strong, always a strong dim uh, generational dimension that there's basically um, people accusing one generation of um, ruining everything, of having ruined everything, and um, or that um, um, basically young people's young people have to forsake their education so that we can um, 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 protect the health of the older generation. And so the idea is that basically that the world is in need of policies that have like intergenerational benefits. And so if we can show that older generations benefit in terms of health from investing into education of the younger generation, that would be kind of like a good thing because it would be kind of like a win-win situation. And so this is why we think this is, has possibly important implications in policy terms. And also obviously these education spillovers are attractive to policy makers because there would no, as I said, there would be no generational trade-off. And so we already know that education, that we like to believe that education can solve all sorts of problems in the world. We often don't have the evidence, but policymakers love this. They have kind of like levers where they can funnel money into education if they want to. And they have all the rhetorics in place. They can easily um, write speeches that tell you that they're going to uh, uh, solve generational divides now by investing into the younger people's education. So this is kind of attractive if we can find this. And a lot of people have found this in previous research and we were kind of like a bit more skeptical. But um, in terms of can we actually, why would we actually think that children's education has a positive effect on parental health? Isn't this a bit counterintuitive? And so what we've learned from the literature is that basically 
we have different pathways that could help us um, um, understand that we could investigate um, um, how children's education can improve parental health. And one of these things is possibly better health behaviors. We do know that people who have spent more time in education generally have better health behaviors, either because it's kind of like something cognitive or because um, people who spend a lot of time in education also have a lot of time for going to the gym or something. Um, and we also know that these kind of like health behaviors like spread that basically possibly you and uh, better educated children would inform their parents at some point that smoking is unhealthy. Um, and then these parents would stop. So there are studies that show that parents of better educated children are less likely to die of lung cancer. So we have like evidence that is in line with this. Also, so a pathway that would be interesting or would be um, clear is that you, you, children with higher earnings, we know that children who have a, a higher education have higher earnings, and these higher earnings the children could then use for supporting parents, either generally in old age, supporting them financially, or specifically investing into their health care, into, into their parents' health care. That would be a pro quite intuitive way of um, um, explaining this association between children's education and pa parental health uh, intuitively. Also, better education goes along with better jobs. So possibly this is um, a pathway that um, supports children. Possibly these jobs are more stable or these jobs are... Um, better in terms in in terms of field so possibly you if you if your children are doctors or if your children are nurses they can provide you with direct health care that is directly better for your health that would be a possible pathway um and something else is that you have less stress with better educated children so we have evidence that parents suffer when their children get divorced or their children get unemployed or their children get arrested by the police or the children possibly drop out of high school. Um, so we know that if you have less stress, if, if you have better educated children, they're more successful in life and you generally have less stress, this might have positive consequences for your health. These are kind of like the causal pathways. But if we think about this kind of like logically, there's a lot of variables that could be confounding this. You could think that po possibly it's a neighborhood effect and that if you live in a good neighborhood, there's a good school and um, um, parents live uh, parents live longer in better neighborhoods or it could be genes that you pass on genes to your children that um, uh, lead them to have a good education and these genes would also uh, cause you to live longer so we can think of many reasons why uh, why, we, why we can think of many reasons why there might be a causal relationship we can also think of many reasons why there might be not a causal relationship why this might be pure confounding and so if you read the studies that are um uh that have been published and that um 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 show associations between children's education and parental health you will see that if you read them closely you will see that hmm, maybe these estimates that they're showing are kind of biased and so in one of the earliest studies by um Esther Friedman and Rob Mayer um um, they show that if all of your children have finished college and versus all of your children have not finished high school, this would give you an additional two years of life, which is kind of a lot if you think of this in substantive terms. So I, I have a son now who's um, almost five and he's just started school and basically he loves going to school, but every morning I have to get him dressed and put on his funny school uniform and his shoes and like it is a lot of work and so 
um, he, uh, despite the fact that he wants to go to school, I think if my son decides that he wants to drop out of high school and I have to drag him through college, I, it's not going to add two years of my life. I think it's going to have a <laughs> negative effect. So there, there's good reasons to assume, like just kind of like intuitively, maybe this is um, um, uh, upwardly biased, the associations we find. Um, he might be dressing himself by then. He might be dressing like <laughs> not if he wants to drop out of school. <laughs> um, but also, if you read the paper closely, you will see that the um, uh, association that um, they find for the respondents themselves, if they have not finished high school um, versus finished college, it is only 1.65 years. So having better educated children it has apparently a stronger effect of education than edu than your own education for yourself. And also possibly um, this was kind of like the point where we thought, mm, this is suspicious. Maybe we need different designs <clears throat> to um, identify this possible effect of children's education for um confounders and so when we started this is kind of like a project that has been going on for a long time you've seen that the first paper has already been published and it has been before it was published it was rejected quite a few times but basically if you look at the studies that exist that um, basically where the identifications are G is that we control for observed confounders like stuff any of these use that you can think of, so for instance, parental education or parental occupation or parental wealth or these stuff, you can try to identify this effect here by, by controlling for use. Um, and so if you look at these effects, then you can see that basically almost all show an association between children's education and parental health. Um, but possibly they're not controlling for all the possible confounders that you can think of in your mind. And the other thing is that also the question is, what is a confounder in this context? Because you, if you think about the pathways, we know that, for instance, um, children's earnings might be a um, pathway variable. But according, if you're, if you're thinking about the confounders, parental wealth that might be partially due to children's earnings, if the pathway is correct, then this we shouldn't be controlling for that. So basically, possibly we don't even know what we should be controlling for. Then um, obviously the other strategy is kind of like think about natural experiments, for instance, educational reforms, which is what I'm going to be doing here for the most part there. Um, and this is something that I counted just earlier this week. Uh, completely new for this um, uh, presentation here. There we have 18 studies, not counting the ones presented here. And they pr basically show way more mixed results, but they also have been conducted mostly in low to medium income countries. So out of these 18 studies, eight um, overall have been conducted in China and very few have been conducted in uh, the usual countries because obviously, in the US, you don't really have educational reforms in the last decades that you could use for this. And um, in other countries, it's also difficult to find suitable data sets or studies use share and basically, so, so the European survey of health, aging, retirement in Europe, and just pool all the countries and then show some sort of effect across all countries that you don't know how to really, but basically most of this research has been conducted in low to medium income countries. So in Africa or in China, and there obviously um, you people usually find effects, but obviously it's kind of like a very different um, uh, game. If you're, for instance, looking at, there's a one study looking at an education reform in Tanzania, when basically the mandatory school age, uh, so school leaving age was changed from four years of schooling to five years of schooling or six years of schooling. That's, of course, something completely different than what we are facing here in Great Britain or in other European countries. And so in this first paper, that we published earlier this year in Journal of Health and Social Behavior. We basically um, 
took a first stab at this by looking at um, the so-called longitudinal study, which is linked census data from uh, England and Wales, and the 1972 educational reform that raised the school leaving age from in England and Wales from 15 to 16 years. And so this is a beautiful paper that we invested insane amounts of time into like literally we could have written four papers in this time. Um, and so in a first step, we looked at the 1958 British birth cohort study for a reason that becomes clear in the next uh, uh, slide. So basically what we, so, and this is basically all children born in Great Britain in one week of 1958. And these people are um, interviewed every few years. And whenever they're interviewed, they're also being asked about their parents, whether their parents are still alive, how old their parents are, and whether they, at what age their parents have might have died. And so basically we show that there is an association between um, children's education and parental longevity, even when we control for parental education and parental social class. And also we get a prediction here from these models that is in line of what Friedman and Mayer were um, uh, um, um, I'm showing, namely that having a child leaving school at, 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 at 21 rather than at 16 gives you two more years of life. But obviously, this is only an association. In the next step, we then used the ONS longitudinal study. And um, this is linked census data, census records of people born on four not disclosed dates of the year across for, since 1971 until, I don't know, probably the last census or the one before that. And um, also it links it with life, certain life events such as uh, death. And also, I think there's also a link to the cancer register. So you can also do research on cancer with uh, the longitudinal study. And here you can see basically in the 1971 census form, women who were married, um, and under the age of 60, they're being asked to write down the month and the year of the children that they have given birth to. And so this is basically the only information that we're using here in this, uh, or like the key information that we're using here that we know that these uh, parents have children and uh, they were affected by the, ref by, by the education reform in 1972. We can figure it out from their birth dates. We know we, we, there's a lot of important things that we don't know about the children. For instance, we don't know whether they're boys or girls. We don't know whether they possibly, poss I think we don't know whether they died, but I think that wasn't super common in the 1970s anymore in Britain. We also don't know anything about children born out of wedlock. Um, but that was also not particularly common in the 1970s in uh, England or Wales. And we also don't know whether these children who were then forced or not forced to stay longer in education, whether they actually stayed longer in education or not. So we only know whether they were supposed to stay longer in education. And we know that most of the children did, but we don't know for sure important implications. And so this gives us a lot of people here that we have information about, uh, the parents. And um, these are the educational reforms that happened in Britain in the last century. There was one in 1947 and there was one in 1972. Both of these were decided in the so-called Education Act, which is also known as the Butler Act. And it was basically um, in 1947, it was decided that the school leaving age should be raised from 14 to 16. And in the first step, it would be um, in 1947. And then the second step was supposed to take place um, uh, as soon as possible, as, as, as soon as it was feasible. Turned out it was only several decades later that it was became feasible. Um, I'm pointing this out because um, uh, 
often people say, well, yeah, that's only one an increase of one year. What is this really? You have to think about it. This is actually kind of like a lot of uh, resources you need to spend to make everybody stay a year. You need to hire teachers. You need to build buildings to keep these children in. Um, I think in these, the uh, uh, prominently or famously, these um, uh, education reforms didn't come with a new syllabus. So basically, um, there was no no resources devoted to coming up with stuff that children should be learning in these additional years in time. But so obviously, you can always ask yourself what is kind of like a correct education reform. I would say here, this is uh, probably the purest education reform because children are just being forced to stay in school and learning anything there. And so basically the intuition for this is that basically we can, we can care the children who were just born before the cutoff, where, where they needed to stay a year longer, to the children after the cutoff. And so the idea is that basically these children don't differ like in anything observable um, because it's really just a few days or a few months before um, um, the, that they differ in birth age or in, 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 in a time of birth. And um, because they don't differ in really thing any, anything sensible, we also can assume that they're not differing in unobservable stuff. And so this is kind of like the um, intuition for everything that um, you will see here. And so we did this with the um, uh, longitudinal study. You can see here, we don't really find everything. So we look at death, we look at death before age 64, we look at preventable death, we look at several causes of death, and then in the census form since the 1990s, people are being asked about um, uh, their subjective health, so whether they have a long-standing illness or whether they have um, a poor self-rated health. So we also look at that. You can see here that all kind of like the blue stuff here is not significant. Only the red stuff here is statistically significant. So um, despite this large sample size, we basically see that these are small effects. They're often not in the direction that we would expect. Also, we're doing a whole lot of tests here. So we should be honest to ourselves and um, 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 admit that if you know significance testing, you have learned that these things can be just uh, significant by chance. And so if you co correct for the number of tests that we have done, then nothing of this should be significant. Um, and also we kind of like have a lot of information about the uh, socioeconomic status of the parents. Um, when we stratify by high and low socioeconomic status, there is... Um, also, no clear pattern, a lot of tests, nothing really significant. And so these are the findings. So what we find here in this first study is that children's education is, associ is not associated. <laughs> a surprise. Not associated with parental longevity in Britain. Oh, it is associated, but there's no evidence for a causal effect. Um, oh, oh, yeah. The price should be reading those slides. Okay. Uh, or should not be reading those slides. Mm. So we have no evidence for a causal effect. Possibly we have many reasons to think that this might be. Um, so these are ITT estimates. So these are estimates that we, we only know whether children were supposed to stay in school. We don't know whether they actually stayed in school. And we know that these types of estimates can be um, overly conservative and small when a lot of children don't stay in school for if they're supposed to. So if compliance is low, um, possibly it's also that this one increase from 10 to 11 years of schooling is not relevant for parental health, but maybe it's relevant at other points of the edu educational distribution. Or maybe there's something about sex specific effects that basically, so there's like a paper on uh, Swedish data and it's uh, written by economists and they come up with a story that basically, um, or like in the working paper version of their paper that's, that you can find on the internet, it says like, well, there's no effect in Sweden. 
uh, end of story and then kind of like in the published paper, oh, we find this really intricate story that basically if fathers have higher educated daughters and the fathers are lower educated, well, then we find an effect. And so maybe there's something like this in here, but we can't find it. And so basically um, we, we, we kind of like thought this is a good study. But um, uh, reviewers hated it because one year of schooling really is this a lot. And maybe there's something spec sex specific. And also, uh, why is this about England and not about the US? And, uh, <laughs> and um, 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 yeah, so basically, uh, we thought at some point in my life, I thought um, 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 we, we could do this with a different data set. It occurred to me that basically you can do this with um, ELSA. And um, here we can take into account two education reforms, namely the one that was before, the one from 1947. Um, and you also know a lot of stuff about the children that we didn't know in the census data. Obviously, this data set has uh, uh, downsides also, it's much smaller. And um, it's the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, and it's basically a panel study that has been going on since 2002. And it's the older English population of roughly 20,000 uh, uh, people. And every wave, they also say, just like in the birth cohort study, whether their parents are still alive, how old they got. And, um, um, and um, um, also, we wasted a lot of time getting a special licensed version of the data set that has the monthly birth date information that is not in the regular data set. So this was something that, uh, yeah. And so basically what you can see here is uh, a Kaplan-Meier plot where you can basically see how parents die earlier if their children are less educated. It is not like a huge effect, but I think it's also like um, um, you, you can see with your eyes here on these slides that, that there are differences. And um, I'm not showing you all the tables, but you've seen the paper. It's on the Internet. You can download it and cite it <laughs> if you want to. And so basically, again, looking at the uh, intent to treat effect, the effect where the children were supposed to stay in school, and uh, um, goes along with an increase in life expectancy for their parents at age 60 of 0.17. I think that's kind of like two months roughly for men to 0.19 years for women. And so I guess three and a half months. Um, so it's not a huge effect, but it's statistically significant in these models based on smaller data set and importantly we can also get the local average treatment effect so for the people who weren't just supposed to stay in school longer but they also stayed in school longer and there you can actually get a relatively large effect so for uh, half a year to more than a year for men to almost a year to one and a half years for women and so apparently staying in school longer is apparently good for your parents. And we then also try to stratify these results for these children um, by gender and class. And also here we don't really see a um, clean story, possibly because the sample size is too small. Because you can see here that for working class children, who um, are for working class parents whose children stayed in school longer, their hazard of dying is significantly smaller than uh, zero. So it's good for working class parents. For upper class parents, um, the co point estimates are virtually the same, but it's not statistically significant. So it's like not really a good story coming out of this. Here you can see that apparently for upper class children in this reform or for upper class parents, it's not significant points into the wrong direction. It's um, difficult to say, like, but obviously here also the confidence intervals are overlapping. Not a good story coming out of this. 
And in terms of gender, we can find that daughters have a larger effect than sons in the 1947 reform. But generally, there's not a beautiful story coming out that would tell us um, it is sons, uh, 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 it is daughters of uh, working class fathers who are uh, doing all of the work here. But so so we don't we we don't find that it's just kind of like mixed back. Um, so we can't really so unfortunately we can't really replicate the findings for study one. We also don't really know why this would be the case. Obviously, it's a different data set. It is uh, many variables are measured differently. Um, possibly, we can agree that the ITT in both studies is substantively small. In one, it is significant. In the other one, it isn't. And also, our gender definings are difficult to reconcile with different simple explanations. But kind of like the idea of doing this. So then um, uh, in the third study, uh, we using the health and retirement study, which is a sister study of ELSA, it is um, to the delight of reviewers, uh, a study in US. <laughs> Study conducted in the US. Also, a shout out to one of the reviewers who would always spell England and Wales, and in Wales, he would always spell like the fish. <laughs> uh, but uh, here we want to use a completely different uh, uh, identification strategy that will not just give us a local average treatment effect, but basically an average treatment effect. We found that was a uh, beautiful promise. Um, obviously, this comes at a cost, namely of a complicated model that no one really has a understanding. But basically, I've already told you in the US, nobody does has done this research because we don't really have good education reforms that we can use for these purposes. But we do have good genetic data. And so the health and retirement study has been going on since 1994. Uh, 1994, and in the 2000s, people participating in the study, or roughly 10,000 people participating in the study, were genotyped. And so we know about their genetic predispositions. And we know that there are people who have certain endowments, genetic endowments, that are associated with higher education. So you can see here. This is kind of like we um, conduct, or we didn't luckily, um, conduct a so-called gen genome-wide association study, and we see which uh, um, uh, SNPs or which genetic predispositions are associated with more years of schooling. And basically, we use all this information to get one so-called polygenic score, which is then associated with... Um, with, with years of schooling. And you can see here that this is actually not a bad prediction because it explains 8% of um, uh, years of schooling. And um, we then use this information as an instrument. So you can see here that we have 10,000 um, 10, respondents that we know the information about the father and 11,000 respondents where we know whether their parents are still alive. And um, because we're not reading any recent papers in econometrics, we also think that an instrument with an F value greater than 10 is a good instrument. Um, here we see that we have huge F values. And in order to run these models, we use two, uh, we use um, not two stage least square, but Cox regression because we have time to event outcomes with two-stage resource uh, re uh, residual inclusion um, strategy. Um, so it's kind of like two-stage SLS. But And what we can see here is if we instrument schooling like this, we do find that mother's habit of dying is roughly 6% smaller in this instrumented estimate. We don't really find the same thing for men. Um, 
the coefficient is kind of like in the same neighborhood. So it's probably not statistically different from one another, but it's it is not statistically different from one. So what we we don't find an effect for fathers. We don't find uh, we do find one for will for mothers, and um, we are controlling for all sorts of stuff. It's not here on the slide. In terms of uh, this is I, I told you that this there's a very large robo, um, um, uh, work in progress part to this. The work in progress part is particularly this paper. So what we've done here is that basically we've controlled for other polygenic scores. So for instance, we have also information about genetic endowments for living longer or for important diseases. We control for these to see whether possibly the exclusion restriction is violated. So the exclusion restriction being here, there's no direct path here from the uh, should not have touched the screen. There's no direct path here from the genes to parental longevity. Obviously, this is very difficult to justify, um, but there's also other important assumptions that are difficult to justify. Um, so we tried to kind of like control for this by controlling for other polygenic scores. <laughs> And this is something that was successful. What we haven't done for yet, but we would need to have a more detailed version of the data set, would be using the single SNPs that go into the polygenic scores as instruments to check the exclusion restriction. Um, this would be something. Then what we, something else that we could do is that we could exclude single SNPs that are where we know that they possibly violate the exclusion restriction, we could exclude those and see whether the results hold. Then something else that we can do in the data set is that we also we don't just know about participants' parents, but we also know about participants' children and participants' children education. So we could run the entire analysis kind of like in the other direction and something that we haven't done so far. And um, we could also look at possible mechanisms because we know a lot of stuff about, particularly about the children of participants and um, participants themselves. So we could see what, whether whether they live close to their children. So does it do you, that would give you information about possibly whether it's care provided to children or whether it's just kind of like knowing that your children are well but they live in a different country in a different part of the world. So, so that would give you insights into that, something that we also haven't done. So in terms of um, findings, basically, to sum, sum this part up, so there's possibly a causal effect of children's education for mother's longevity, but there's generally a lot to do um, So that we haven't done and we're slowly inching towards this. And we also have a lot of potential to investigate mechanisms with this data set. And importantly, let me stress this again, this is the first causal study with US data, the greatest country, <laughs> the benchmark for any social science study. Um, yes, and so this brings me almost on time. Uh, towards the end of this. And so basically, as I was saying, there's kind of like not a clear story coming from this. Possibly there is some evidence that adult children cause better parental health, even in high income countries. Um, whether having a publicly funded healthcare system like you have in Great Britain versus the US doesn't seem to really play a role. And it also, Possibly it's an illustration of the problems of uh, replication and so social sciences because you have kind of like the same people trying to answer the same research question with a different data set. And obviously we're not, not against publishing null findings or like, I don't know, we were just, yeah, yeah. So, so basically this, but but it seems that there's differences between different data sets that we just can't, despite our best in despite our best intentions, can't resolve. And like I don't know, 
what what your take is on this. But uh, thank you very much for paying attention and um, uh, also best wishes to the people on the internet. Okay.